I'd like to go ahead and welcome everyone tonight to our Bible study in the book of Revelation. Uh, we are now in Revelation chapter 9, and we're going to deal tonight with the sixth trumpet judgment. So I wanted to go back tonight to Revelation 8 just for a second and look at those trumpet judgments that we discussed, we've discussed in the past. You remember that there was a judgment against all of the vegetation, the grass was destroyed, and then we had a, a judgment against all of the sea. A third of the sea was destroyed, a third of the ships, uh, and all of that was going on. And then we had the, the judgment against the rivers, and then the judgment on the heavens. And at the end of chapter 8, when we got to the end of chapter 8, the Word of God says in verse 13, And behold, uh, and I beheld and heard an eagle flying through the midst of the heavens, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. And uh, there are some who believe that, that, that this time when, when the devil is cast down would be uh, somewhat uh, the time of the middle of the tribulation when we enter into the great tribulation. You know, that's the time when the abomination, abomination of desolation takes place, when the Antichrist would walk right into Jerusalem and, and declare himself to be God. Uh, the devil will be cast down and will no longer have access to the heavenlies. And so what we studied last week was Revelation 9, when that star fell from heaven. And that's not a real star. That was a person that was a him. It said that, the, you know, that a star fell from heaven. And to him was given the keys to the bottomless pit. And so we know that that is the devil. He opened the bottomless pit like we discussed last week. And there was smoke that came out of the pit like a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened. And then these demon locusts came up out of the bottomless pit. And we discussed last week about how those demons have been bound and how they're those that sinned in Genesis 6. And you can go back, if you missed that, you can go back and watch that and hear that explanation of how all of these demons were bound in the abuso, in the bottomless pit, where none of those demons really want to be. They do not want to be there. You remember when the Lord Jesus uh, cast the devils out of legion, and they said, please, don't cast us into the abyss. Don't put us in the abuso. And so these demons are set loose, they're angry, they come out, and they're like locusts upon the earth, and they sting uh, people, torture people, uh, for a period of 150 days or for five solid months that they are torturing people. It's a horrible time upon the earth and things that people are going through. The Bible says that they will want to die, but they are just not able to die. They, they would like to be able to die, but they cannot die. So that is a picture of a demonic attack upon the earth. After all the things that have occurred uh, previously, now you have these demons just coming out, and the devil knows that his time is short, and he's just going crazy torturing people. But again, God is holding the limitations and says that, you know, he cannot kill anybody. Well, in verse 12 then, we have one woe is past, and I'm in chapter 9, verse 12. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. So these are, uh, this is another trumpet judgment, the sixth trumpet judgment, and then, of course, the seventh trumpet judgment will open up all of the vials. The vile judgments are what some, uh, some translations call the bold judgments. So we're going to look tonight at this sixth trumpet and look at the judgment that occurs in this sixth trumpet. It is, it's a very, very tough judgment because the Bible says that because of this, one-third of the earth's population is destroyed. You remember that when we, when we were over in Revelation chapter 6 and we had all of the seal judgments, you remember that we ended up with a third of the earth, or a fourth of the earth's population that was destroyed at that time. Well, then we come over here to this sixth trumpet and another third of the earth's population is gonna die in this judgment. So, you know, if we're talking about 
this is half of the world's population. So you're talking about if there you know, ends up being 8 billion people or whatever there is at that time, you're talking about 4 billion people that have lost their lives uh, by at the end of this time when we get to the end of the sixth trumpet judgment. So that's, that's a horrible thing uh, to, to uh, see and to see that happens in the time of the tribulation period. Revelation 9, 13. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. So you remember that the altar was there, the incense uh, was being burned there at the altar, and it was coming up before the Lord as the prayers of the saints, and the prayers, as we found out uh, in the fifth seal, that those, those souls were there, they were praying, that these that were martyred during the tribulation period, and also all the prayers of the saints are here, where the prayers of the saints have come up at the beginning of chapter 8, and they're coming up before God, and the prayers are maybe, how long, O oh Lord, will you not avenge uh, our blood upon the earth, upon those people that are on the earth? And these trumpet judgments come, and they're coming from this golden altar. Now, if you go back to Exodus 30, and you're going to see the way that the altars were laid out, there are two different altars. The brazen altar is where the sacrifice was made. And then the golden altar was right before you would go into the Holy of Holies. There was that golden altar. And it was there that the high priest would go in the morning and he would go at night and he would offer prayers. He would take coals off of the brazen altar and he would lay it up on the golden altar. And the, the smoke and the incense from that golden altar would go up before the Lord as prayers on behalf of all of the saints. And so that's where we're, what we're looking at. The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar. Now, you remember in the book of Hebrews, it talks about how that these altars that were made here on earth, they were but a picture of the altar that was in heaven. So what was created on earth is a replica, a, and it, it is to be symbolic, but, but it was an altar, but also it was not the true. The true was up in heaven. It was just a symbol, uh, a, a forerunner, or, or, just not, or just a symbol of what was up in heaven. So this altar is in heaven, this golden altar before God, where the incense is to be burned, and it's coming up before God. And this has come up before the Lord, uh, that, you know, these judgments are coming because of the prayers of the saints, that we would cry out to God, oh God, the world has gotten so awful, and then so many people, you're thinking about, you know, after this trumpet judgment, billions of people that have lost their life, and so those that have been killed are crying out to God, uh, along with all of our prayers, oh God, you know, do something to correct all of the evil that is going on in the world. So the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now, I want to just slow down just a little bit and look at these four angels. Loose the four angels which are bound. Now, these angels are not holy angels. They are bound, just like you go back in, you know, at the beginning of Revelation 9, and you had all of those demons that were bound in the bottomless pit. The holy angels are not bound. They, they're not, you know, they're not just uh, uh, bound up. These are, these are wicked demons, demonic angels that are followers of Satan, and they're bound in the great river Euphrates. So they, they have been sent there. They have been held there. And so they're bound at the great river Euphrates. Uh, and I want to talk about it just a little bit. So there are four angels that were demons that have been bound and are bound at this present day, awaiting this time when they will be loosed. Uh, and, and, they're, and I believe that, you know, it's very possible that when you're thinking about the, the uh, you're thinking about these angels that are there, you, you're possibly looking at maybe four generals that are demon generals that possibly, uh, you know, uh, would point back even to those world empires that came from the area of the Euphrates, 
where you've got the Assyrian Empire that's there, the Euphrates River running right down through there, the Babylonian Empire, the Medio Persian, the Greek Empire. It's possible that those kingdoms, you know, that, that have come through the years in that area were actually in the workings of demons that were working to bring up those world empires. And while God is there overseeing and allowing things to go on, sometimes the, the world powers so many times are influenced by demon influences. And so these are held and they're bound uh, at the great river Euphrates. So we want to talk just a little bit about this idea of the possibility of, of demons being in charge of areas and having geographical areas that they that maybe Satan had assigned them over and they have had their influence. Uh, one particular place, do you remember in Daniel chapter 10 when Daniel was fasting? It's where we get the Daniel fast from. He was praying for 21 days and he was fasting and calling upon the Lord on behalf of his people. And he really wanted to know what the future of Israel was going to be. And so he started praying, and he's calling upon God, and he's fasting, and he's like, oh God, what about the future of Israel? And he's just so burdened for his people. And he prayed for 21 days. Well, then the angel, and I believe it was Gabriel, he came, and he, and he, uh, he stood like before Daniel, and he gave him this layout of the future of Israel, which involves the 70 weeks of Daniel, which just traces the, the future uh, of all of what will come to Israel in the future. Well, when that angel came and he, uh, he talked to Daniel, the, he said unto him, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. So the moment that Daniel started praying, the words were heard. God knew. Uh, and, and so at that, he said, And I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. And so for, for all of these, this time, this angel had come, just as the minute that Daniel called upon God and he prayed that prayer, the minute that he prayed, God sent an angel to come and to reveal to him the answer to his prayer. But while he was on the way, the, the, the Bible says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. And so, and then the Bible says, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people might look at this and they might want to say, well, this is just talking about a prince. Well, I want you to understand, like for instance, if you're thinking about the, the power of an angel to overcome a human army, okay, if you're thinking about that, I want to go back to when Hezekiah was surrounded by the Assyrian army. And, and Hezekiah called upon God, and he prayed, Oh, God, deliver us. Oh, God. And he called upon the Lord, and the Lord sent one angel. And that one angel destroyed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. There's not an army that could have withstood this angel for 21 days. This was a demon force. And it was there as the, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And in the heavenlies, there was a, a heavenly war going on. And Michael, the archangel, came uh, to the aid of this angel. And, and so uh, you see this picture. Well, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, the Bible says, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that thou worketh in the children of disobedience. And so we have this, uh, we have this examples in the Bible of these demons that are working in the heavenlies and they're, they're working to do all that they can to cause chaos and there's a real war going on in the heavenlies. And thank God 
that the Lord is able to restrain the evil. And it's something that people don't understand in the day we live, that when we turn our back as a society upon God, we are no match for demon forces without the power of God. And so it concerns me so much that people don't recognize that, that most of what's going on in our society right now is just demon activity that's being let go. If you've ever been on a foreign, in a foreign country where people have just turned their hearts over in some places, if you go to some places where they've just turned their back upon God for centuries, you will see the manifestation of demonic activity. Well, this is what we see happening here in, in Daniel. And then we see this right here in Revelation where these four angels were bound in the great river Euphrates. And, and that area, when you start thinking about Euphrates, the Euphrates River uh, has its origin in Turkey up uh, near Mount Ararat, you know, where the, where the Ark was. And then it flows along in Syria and Iraq. It was the place... Uh, it flowed there where the Garden of Eden was, the place, that area where the first sin was committed, where the first murder was, where the Tower of Babel was, where these, uh, the Babylonian, uh, the Babylonian Empire, all of those things. It's kind of like a center of demonic activity. And so we see that there are these four angels that have been bound in the river, at the river Euphrates. They're, they're demons. And that's what is occurring. So the Bible says in Revelation 9, 15, then, and the four angels were loosed. So they're let go. Now this is a judgment upon the world. And you just remember, the demons of hell have already just poured out for five months. But they could not kill anybody. But they tortured people for 150 days so badly that those people wanted to die. And now we turn around and these four demons that are demon generals, and I kind of tend to believe that they may have been those who oversaw all of those world empires that came from that area, that they had, in, they had sort of been the, the igniting power behind those armies that took over the world. And as those empires were laid aside one by one, they end up bound by the power of God in that area of the Euphrates, and they're bound because of all that they've done, and then the Lord is going to let them loose as a part of our ju a part of judgment upon the world. And it, it just, I just pray that people, you know, that think that you can have all kinds of ungodly things going on in society, and God just doesn't care. Listen, it, a lot of times people don't realize the judgment of God sometimes is just simply withdrawing and turning loose the devil to do what he wants to do. And and, you know, somebody, somebody might say, well, the, the Lord's just too good of a God and he loves us too much to hurt us. But I want to tell you this, the devil doesn't love us. And what people need to understand is that when God withdraws and he just says, you've chosen, I'm going to withdraw, the devil has a heyday. And that's exactly what's going to happen in the tribulation period when the devil, that star, will fall from heaven and we discussed that last week about Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 where he was cast out, but he had access to the heavenlies and that heavenly war. And then in Revelation 12, he's cast down to the earth. And when he does, does like that, he's just going to go, he knows his time is short and he's just going to do everything he can to try to destroy. So the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. Mercy. This is a picture of, you know, uh, I don't know how many people will be left, but after that fourth is destroyed, if, there's, if there are six billion people left on the earth, who knows? I know the Christians will be raptured, but, you know, this could be as much as two billion people just by this trumpet judgment. Now, the Bible says that they're prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year. And what I would want to talk about for a second is to say that there's two ways of interpreting this. And I think that that either one of them, you know, I, either one of them still doesn't take away from the passage. But there is a definite article that you don't find in the King James Version, but it says, prepared for the hour and a day and a month and a year. There's a definite article in the original language before that, that that maybe says that this is God's sovereignty 
that God is saying, I know the exact hour, the exact, the exact day, the exact month, and the exact year that I have appointed to turn these demons loose. This points to the sovereignty of God, which is certainly true and absolutely. God, who knows all things, knows the very hour, even to the very second, when these demons at the, at the river Euphrates will be let loose. God knows all about that. So he knows that. But there also is an interpretation that looks at this as a timing type thing uh, in, inside the great tribulation period. So if you have a year and a month, that's 13 months, and a day and an hour. And what they are saying is that this judgment would last for 13 months, a day, and an hour. And so I, I really would say that, you know, uh, it's possible that it is pointing to that, but also very much that it's pointing to God being sovereign and knowing the exact time. Well, they were given that period of time there, you know, like the in, in Revelation 9 when it's talking about the locusts, they have five months that the Lord puts a time, and then here uh, it possibly could be a 13th month. And I would not argue that for very long uh, but I also think that it also is pointing to the time that the Lord knows the exact time. Well, they're prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000. And I heard the number of them. Well, there's no word in the Greek for million. I, I don't know that they ever had to deal with million very often. And I certainly know that John would not be able to count the army. And so he heard the number of them that someone would speak out that the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, 200 million. This army of 200 million, and I heard the number of them. Well, I want to look at this and give you two interpretations of this 200 million man army. And... I struggle with really, uh, there are some that say that these are demons, that this is not a literal human army, but rather when these uh, four demons that are at the Euphrates, when they let loose and they, they are unbound, then they, like generals, take over an army of demons. And these descriptions, certainly, if you look at the description of these, uh, you certainly could come up with that and say that these are demons. There, there's some great preachers that will talk about this as being demons. There are many that believe this, and then there are also many that believe it's a literal army. Uh, John MacArthur says this is demons, definitely demons. And there are many that believe that. And, and, uh, and I kind of tend to think that that may be exactly what that is. Uh, but I also want to point out that there's some other very reputable scholars that believe that this is a literal army that also is pointing even forward to uh, Revelation 16. And so I just want to talk about that. So there are some that believe this is a 200 million demons. And can you imagine, I mean, what that would be like? Here you've had five months of these locusts that were demons that were not allowed to kill anyone. And then you turn around and you have this maybe 13 month period of, of demons that are 200 million strong that are going around and they are killing 2 billion people or whatever the number may be, but a third of the earth's population. This is why this is called the great tribulation. You do not want to be here. I'm telling you, if you don't know the Lord, you do not want to be here during this time. It, you know, we talk about it and it seems like some kind of a movie that you're thinking about that is not even real, like sci-fi or something that's not real. This is really going to happen on the earth. It's going to happen just like this. And so we see, you know, that's just a horrible, horrible thing. And then there's also th those that believe that this may be that army gathering that would uh, prepare the way for them to come even forward in like in Revelation 16 when you talk about the sixth vile judgment and then this army traveling from the east over over the Euphrates when it is dried up. So I do want to read that in Ephesians, I mean in Revelation chapter 16. So if you've got your Bible, turn over to Revelation 16 
and we're going to look at that and read the sixth vial. And we'll cover this a little bit better later, but I just want to look at it and let you see, you know, that some uh, believe this is a preparation army that will be killing people as they come, and so many will be wiped out, and then that great battle uh, will, will come later. But look at Revelation 16, 12 through 16. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dry 